what really matters. When I was 12 years old, I began writing to the father of Anne Frank, Otto Frank. It was in the mid-50s. The play was already very a big success, The Diary of Anne Frank, on Broadway. The book has, was becoming a classic, and I was discovered in the San Fernando Valley, California, by a, a town scout who asked me to audition for the part of Anne for the 20th Century Fox movie. Well, uh, you know, I hadn't even read the diary at that point, but once I did, I fell in love with her. And I couldn't believe that such a wonderful young person could be snuffed out in the Holocaust like that. Like so many teenagers, I identified with her. She seemed to be speaking for all of us. But most of all, I love how she talked about her father, that wonderful man, Otto Frank. She and her sister, Margaret, had nicknamed Pim. I loved him. I loved him, too. Well, I tried out for the part, and surprise, surprise, I didn't get it. <laughs> Stupid them. But you know, beautiful, gorgeous Millie Perkins got the part. And as bummed out as I was, and it mattered so much, I asked the people in the studio, uh, was Otto Frank still alive? Could I write to him? And they gave me his address in Basel, Switzerland. And so began our long and cherished friendship. Our correspondence began first in a little trickle and then a deluge, with Otto guiding me through the years, through my schooling years, through falling in love, marriage, all in all. But it was the, his words to me during the 60s that really rocked me. Our country was faced with the Vietnam War, horrible race riots, the assassinations of President Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., Bobby Kennedy. I was done, and I wrote to him and I said, I will never bring a child into a world this cruel. And he wrote back to me and he said, even if you believe the end of the world would be imminent, you still plant a tree today. And he had two trees planted in Israel in my name to inspire me to have hope. This man, who had every reason to be hopeless, was telling me to live in the moment to focus on life. Oh, how I loved our letters and cards through the years. They meant so much to me. He and his second wife, Fritzi, who we met coming back from the camps with her daughter, were like family to me. He just, it, was, it was amazing, but what he went through in life, in the past, I couldn't even get over that. Fleeing Hitler's growing target against the Jews in Germany, he and his family went to Holland to escape the Nazis. But by 1942, they and others with other Jews with them were forced to go into hiding above Otto Frank's spice factory business in this small apartment sequestered by, behind a bookshelf. Otto, his wife, Edith, his daughters, Anne and Margaret, his business partner, Mr. and Mrs. Von Pels, and their son, Peter, and the dentist, Fritz Pfeffer. All of these people, eight of them, in hiding in this cramped small space, were protected downstairs by four non-Jewish office workers who worked for Otto Frank, especially his devoted assistant, Meet Geese. For two years and one month, this little group lived in fear and hope, with Otto daily guiding his, uh, his daughters and Peter, teaching them, schooling them, whispering their lessons so as not to alert the factory workers below. While Anne poured her heart out from diary to notebooks, her private thoughts and wishes. It was 1944. It looked like the war might be over. Soon they would be free to resume their lives. That's what they hoped. But that is not what happened. For on August 4th, 1944, the little group was captured. All of them all of them except, miraculously, Otto Frank, were killed in the concentration camps where they were sent. When Otto Frank was in Auschwitz, he told a young man, call me Papa, for that is who I am. His identity of being a father was so keen, it fed his soul, and he told him, call me Papa. All that mattered to him in the whole world was to see his beautiful daughters be reunited with them, by 1945, barely, barely alive, he survived and was liberated. And when he went back to Holland, he faced the horrifying fact that his beautiful daughters would never return. That devastating re realization almost destroyed him. He had a choice at that point to give up, and he almost did. 
had not Meep surprised him. When he went back to his office, now leveled by the news of his daughter's deaths, he shouted out, I cannot be disturbed. His life was over. And that's when Meep opened up her desk and pulled out all of Anne's writings that she found scattered across the floor. And she was saving it for Anne when she came back from the camps, but finding out that would never happen, Meep gathered it all and placed it all in front of the grieving father, putting his hands on top of the diary and saying, this is your daughter's legacy. Had he looked, he could have been a bitter, angry, revengeful man. But he wasn't. He transformed that horrifying matter into a healing, loving force that not only helped himself, but others like me who reached out to him. He published his daughter's letters. He mentored an entire world of young people that needed to know the power of love and hope because that's what mattered to him more than being party to a trial, to anything like that. This man was able to do that. When he looked at this diary and all that Anne had be written, and he was in shock and tears, and he began reading her words, and he couldn't believe that this, the depth and sensitivity of this child that he loved so much. She wanted to go on living even after her death, and so he would honor her words. In time, encouraged by family and friends, he published what became known as the Diary of Anne Frank. Now, years later, I had been writing to my beloved mentor for 18 years, and we still hadn't met in person. And I was preparing now to meet him at the Basel station in Switzerland for the very first time. And I was terrified. Would he be everything I hoped he would be? What would we say when we first saw each other? So I practiced scene A and scene B. Scene A was the, you know, the silver screen moment, the love fest. Scene B was the scene I absolutely hated. It was the, I gotta go, let's have some tea. Mm -hmm. You know, I hated that. But what would it be? Scene B, the formal handshake, or scene A, the happy hugs and tears. And then I saw him standing there, this tall, elegant, beautiful man. I was speechless. I couldn't believe it. It was really him, Otto Frank, and he was smiling, and his arms were outstretched, and he turned to me, and I was in this great big bear hug of an embrace. God, uh, at last, it was scene A. It was scene A. I couldn't believe it. And then we went back home to their apartment, and it was like being greeted by two loving grandparents. Fritzi and Otto showed me the, the family albums that Meep had rescued for them, and you know the, the, all the little trinkets I had sent through, through the years. And then he opened this great big cupboard door, and from ceiling to floor, there were boxes and boxes and boxes of letters. Uh, you're not the only one I write to all these years, Cara. Yeah, I know, but... And then he put this great big box in front of me, and he said, and these are your letters, my letters. He had saved all my letters. It's not that anything they said was that great or mattered so much. It's just that I mattered to him. All of us who wrote to him mattered to him. We were able to help him continue being the parent he was meant to be, and he was our beloved father figure. But there was one moment that was transformative for me when I said to him, Otto, do you know who betrayed you? Because obviously someone he might have even known had turned them in and collected money for all aid in hiding. Do you know who betrayed you? And he turned to me, dropping his voice, and said, it doesn't matter. And I remember screaming inside, it doesn't matter? Someone you might have known had caused the death of your daughters and all the others in hiding, and you're saying it doesn't matter? Well. I didn't say that out loud, but my heart was pounding. I couldn't believe it. But then I looked into his eyes, this beautiful man, and saw that pain, the man who had loved and lost so much. And I realized, of course it mattered. But would it bring his daughters and all the others back to life? No, it would not. There's an expression I like so much, holding on to anger and hatred and revenge. It's like taking poison and hoping it kills the other person. In the end, it was his resolve to transfer all of that, all of that hate, 
into some loving force that saved me, saved others. He published his daughter's wor words. He mentored an entire world of young people, all races and religions, that needed to know the power of love and hope because that's what mattered to him more than being party to a horrid trial or betraying uh, people that were innocent or losing his own focus and power. So he was right. Betraying the betrayer just didn't matter. Now, years later, I was starting all over in my life, uh, and it felt like Otto was still guiding me to plant that tree of hope. I was facing divorce and fear, and simultaneously I was being encouraged by others, including the Frank family, to publish a book about our long friendship and all that Otto taught me. And I was scared because I, you know, I didn't want to fall into this pity party thing that I was feeling, but remembering all that he had gone through and remembering that he survived it, not only survived it, but he grew from it. If he could get up off the floor after all he endured, then so could I. His words, it doesn't matter, rang through me like a mantra. I want to share with you a brief ego buster that I experienced at that time. I was starting over in a small Monterey town, gaining brief notoriety as a published author, and I prayed, oh, please let it be my Oprah moment. <laughs> but I was struggling, and so I took every and any job I could find to support my six animals and me. One of them was banquet server at a large Monterey hotel. So there I was in my black and white uniform, looking like a five-foot-one penguin, and I looked out into this vast conference hall and saw what appeared to me the entire Monterey Peninsula sitting in a sea of tables. And I turned to my team and said, I can't go out there. They know me as a successful author, and look at me, I'm just a loser. And that's what this wise server picked up a basket of bread, and she handed it to me, and she said, she practically shoved me out to my waiting tables, whispering in my ear, it doesn't matter. And there it was. It was like she was channeling Otto with those healing words. It doesn't matter. My ego had convinced me that being an author mattered, and yet being a banquet server at that moment in time was exactly what I was supposed to be and do. What matters the most are the positive choices we make in our lives. It's a chance to really savor the senses we have, to heal, to, to hear, to see, to touch, to feel, or pick up a basket of bread set it on a table just so when no one knows or cares who you are. Life is all about making each moment matter. That's what Otto Frank did. Look, do I like watching myself get older? Uh, not so much. But I'm doing all I can to be grateful and to make seeing matter and hearing matter and breathing matter and listening matter and loving matter. If I'm wringing my hands over what I've just seen and heard on TV or online, that I'm facing each moment blind, deaf, numb to the beauty before me. Look, horrible things are happening on this planet all the time. But it's the choices we can make in our own lives that heal and fuel us and give us the strength to not only help others, but help ourselves focus on what really matters the most are loved ones, animals, nature, the pavement after a rain, laughter, music, all of it, life. Most of the time, when we step outside of ourselves and focus on the very what is before us, we uplift ourselves and everyone around us. I want to read this excerpt from Anne Frank's diary. It touches me so much because it says exactly everything I believe. At this point, the young girl was 14 years old, had been living in that sequestered, confined space for a year and a half. She was 14 when she wrote this. Six months later, she would be captured and sent to the concentration camps, never to return. My dearest Kitty, Feb Wednesday, February 23rd, 1944, my, the weather's been wonderful since yesterday, and I've perked up quite a bit. I go to the attic almost every morning to get the stale air out of my lungs. This morning when I went there, Peter was busy cleaning up. He finished quickly and came over to where I was sitting on my favorite spot on the floor. The two of us looked out at the blue sky, 
the bare chestnut tree glistening with dew, the seagulls and other birds glinting with silver as they swooped through the air. And we were so moved and entranced that we couldn't speak. He stood with his head against a thick beam while I sat. He breathed in the air looking outside and both felt that the spell shouldn't be broken with words. But I also looked out at the open window, letting my eyes roam over a large part of Amsterdam, over the rooftops and onto the horizon, a strip of blue so pale it was almost invisible. As long as this exists, I thought, this sunshine and this endless sky, as long as I can enjoy it, how can I be sad? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.